There are times in our faith where we feel like we're walking through a desert, when the lights seem to have gone out and the wells have run dry, when we feel far from God and the joy of our salvation is lacking. Our relationship to God and the world was once lush and vibrant and growing, now seems to be a labor or doesn't exist at all. We are tired and parched and we live in a time of death. Like mental, emotional, or physical burnout, spiritual burnout is a type of exhaustion. It is directed towards the spiritual responsibilities and elements of our faith. And whether we are overwhelmed by the demands of our ministry or the thought of our Christian duties, the symptoms are typically despair, apathy, and a type of drought that exists in one's spiritual life. We might feel like God doesn't care about us, that our prayers have no effect, that instead of an abundance, we live in lack. Acts of service become difficult to perform, any devotional disciplines feel like a chore, and our obedience is more a matter of will than the overflow of affection we feel in our hearts. Though we believe that God is in control of all things and uses all the seasons of our life for our benefit, this experience is something we would rather avoid. In fact, it can be quite crippling to our well-being, and in these times we run the risk of neglecting our faith. In times of spiritual drought, there are two things that are worth remembering. The righteousness of Christ has made you acceptable to God, and Jesus himself is your provision and life. In Romans chapter 3, we read this, But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified by his grace as a gift the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. The Apostle Paul is highlighting the truth that in Jesus, we are declared completely righteous before God. There is nothing we need to do, or even can do, to receive this. Not only that, but in chapter 8 Paul writes, For those whom he foreknew he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? How shall God not graciously give us all things along with his son, Jesus? In Jesus, God has promised to provide for our every need. In Jesus, we are God's adopted children. John says just as much. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. Near the beginning of the Gospel of Luke, Jesus quotes a passage from the book of Isaiah. This passage would indicate the tone, the theme, and the mission of the Gospel. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has set me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of the sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. The coming of Jesus was a proclamation of the Lord's favor. Because Christ has secured for us his righteousness and right standing before God, we have access to his favor. What does this mean? The Greek word used for favor means pleasure, will, or acceptance. The righteousness of Jesus and his sacrifice has made you acceptable to God. You have not done anything to achieve this. It is, as Paul says, not your own doing. There is no need to do anything more than has already been done for you. See striving and meditate on the knowledge that the all-powerful, all-knowing, sovereign creator is for you, has accepted you, and works everything for your benefit. Because of Jesus, the love that holds all things together burns in your favor. If what Jesus did for us secures these things, what do we need to do? There is no action on our part that will increase God's love or acceptance or desire to provide for us. That is already accomplished in Christ. The cross is a judgment and an open door, the condemnation of all of our strivings and the path to peace with God. In John chapter 15, Jesus uses a curious analogy to describe his relationship with his disciples. I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit he takes away and every branch that does bear fruit he prunes, and it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. 
as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. Christ is saying something about our relationship with him. Just like a branch to a vine, our relationship with Jesus ought to be one of pure dependence and reception. Just as a branch withers and dies and is burned because it separates from the vine, so too is the joy in our life and the health of our faith dependent on our connection to him. By describing himself as the vine, Jesus is saying something about his nature in relation to us. Christ is our nourishment. Not only is Jesus our righteousness and key to God's acceptance, but he is also our source of life. What more do we need outside of Jesus? There is a scene from the Gospel of Luke that we are familiar with. It bears repeating, however, because it serves as an example of how Christians are meant to rest. Now as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving, and she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. Whereas Martha's focus was on serving Christ and his disciples, Mary's focus was simply to sit and listen. Martha had believed that doing things for Jesus was the correct path. Mary believed that simply sitting with Jesus and listening was the correct path. She was blessed by it. Abide in me, is Christ's command. I am the vine, and you are the branches. We are simply meant to receive from Christ. All our works are simply an outpouring or overflow of life that exists from knowing Jesus, just as the fruit of a branch is the outpouring or overflow of the life from a vine. We abide in Christ when we receive from and obey his word, when we receive his presence in adoration and prayer and the community with his body, that is, the church. There is no need to do anything to get God to love you more. There is only living before Christ. Our joy is not found in doing things, but, like Mary, simply sitting at the feet of Jesus. The first call to every believer is not to works, but to Christ himself. And as we draw close to Jesus, as we abide in him through obedience to his commands, in prayer, in worship, and community, we will draw from Christ like a branch draws from a vine. From the overflow of his life, we bear fruit. Understanding all this, how are we to approach times of burnout when we feel apathetic and almost dead towards our faith? We ought to stop, take pause, and consider whether we are pursuing works or pursuing Jesus. Is there anything in our life that is separating us from fellowship with the Holy Spirit? Is there something that we are doing that we know we ought not to be doing? Are we placing works and acts of service before sitting at Jesus' feet? Has our relationship with Jesus become second to other responsibilities, like school or work? Times of joke can be reminders to simply sit with Jesus and remember that God has called us to rest. We cannot control what God will bring into our life, but we can take refuge in the shelter of our fellowship with Jesus, knowing that God works all things for our good, redeeming the time. We can find shelter in the tender affections of Christ, knowing that he loves us and accepts us where we are and as we are. When we understand that Christ is everything we need, we can cling to him and find rest for our souls. The gospel calls us to rest.